episode of the Fertility Podcast with me, Natalie Silverman, your host. Man, it has been a very busy few days. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's been going on in my world. My little boy started school. I've been to a wedding. I've been to a 40th birthday party all in the last three days. So it's been pretty busy. And if you follow me on my socials at Fertility Poddy on Insta and Twitter, you may have seen me talking about what I do as a day job. I'm a professional voiceover artist and I get to do all sorts of different things. This week I've been recording a a radio commercial for um, a brand of shoes that you might see on the high street. And I've also been doing a bit of extra work on a very exciting documentary called The Easy Bit, which you might have seen on social media. The director is a guy called Tom Webb, who I've interviewed on this podcast before, and I'm going to put a link to the chats I've had with Tom. It's all about male fertility and the male experience, and Tom asked me to narrate his film, which I was delighted to do. And it's been an amazing... Oh, you can hear the clattering. Sorry, um, Sunday in my house, my husband's making bolognese. Excuse the clattering. It's been a brilliant kind of scenario for me where my professional world is... Um, as connected with the other part of my world which is the work I do in the facility space making this podcast and Tom and I were doing a bit more work on the on the film today and the premiere for it is going to be on the 28th of September if you listen to this podcast in real time um, I'll put all the links for it in the show notes for this episode so do make sure you listen to the end now what you're going to hear in this episode is another conversation that Kate Davis and I who's my co-host have made for talk Fertility, which is the radio show that we're putting out on UK Health Radio that I also share with you on the podcast feed. And we're speaking to an amazing lady called Jodie Day, who, again, I spoke to Jodie a couple of years ago. She talks about dealing with childlessness at Christmas. And this time Jodie's talking about where she's at, what she's doing, and about, uh, that's my parents arriving, because this is all happening in real time. Jodie is talking about World Childless Week, which is next week all the dates will be at the end i'll remind you at the end of this episode because he's going out to the doors let my parents in so for now though enjoy the show hello and welcome to talk fertility a show where we do just that talk about fertility i'm natalie silverman host of the fertility podcast which i launched in 2015 once successfully pregnant after having fertility treatment And I'm Kate Davis, a trained fertility nurse and founder of Your Fertility Journey, where I work one-to-one with women and couples to help them understand and optimise their fertility. Now today's show is going out ahead of World Childless Week, which is running from the 16th to the 22nd of September. And we're going to be speaking to a lady called Jodie Day. And one of the reasons that we wanted to get your attention on this topic early is that in terms of childlessness, if it is something that is relevant to yourself or maybe somebody you know, the way World Childless Week works is it's got all different events happening through the week. And the website is made up of your contributions and your stories. So we'll explain more about our guest and you'll hear the fascinating interview that we have with her. And we'll give you the details at the end about how you can find out more but just have that in your head that if if you want to share your story then this coming up the 16th of September is a perfect place for you to maybe talk maybe vent about something that you've experienced when it comes to living a life childless because Kate I know um you're really looking forward to speaking with Jodie she is somebody that I've spoken before spoken to before on the fertility podcast you've got her book haven't you I have got her beautiful book right here yes and it's lovely it's it looks gorgeous um and it's a lovely read so yeah I'm really excited about talking to her I'm really excited to understand a little bit more about the gateway um and how she supports women who are coming to a resolution towards the end of their fertility journey so yeah I'm looking forward to it now before we share our chat with Jodie um, we just wanted to kind of explain a bit about how Kate and I create these um, these shows because we are using the power of technology. We are both in different places in the UK, mm-hmm. watching each other um, on our on our phones, which is highly amusing because um, <laughs> stuff goes on in the background. And um, Kate wanted to just give a bit of a caveat to some of the background noise you might hear. In a previous episode, we had a persistent fly. Um, and I did have to we ask did. Kate to remove her very loud clock before we started recording. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then we had a little visit, didn't we, during Jodie? Just explain. Yeah, we had a little furry visit of my golden retriever, Isla. I thought I'd push the door to, so completely my fault. But she obviously pushed her nose and pushed it open. And in my office, I've got wooden floors. So you can imagine four paws with nails coming straight across the wooden floor. And then not only that, she then plonks herself down like old bones on the floor right beside me. So it sounds really awful. So I apologise for that interruption. Like Natalie said, we've had flies and we also had my rumbling tummy. So I seem to be the guilty one for all it the didn't noises. It sounds awful. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a professional voiceover group. I know. It's what I do for a living. I know. It's, it's very real and it was an awful noise. And I think that when you're listening to this episode, if you hear Isla, you need to get in touch with us on and any of us. the social channels that we'll tell you after with the hashtag Isla, all right? Because we need to maybe have Isla as a bit of a feature because we love her. She looked lovely flopping in. She looked so comfortable. She just kind of flumped down. So um, it's a bit like, where's Wally? Where's Isla? That's your task yeah. when you listen. See if you can, yeah, see if you can find it and, and I'll put a picture up on Instagram of Isla. <laughs> Lovely. All right. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Jodie. So I'm now very excited to welcome Jodie Day to the show. Jodie's someone that I've spoken to previously on the Fertility Podcast, and I will make sure I share that conversation. I was really keen for Kate to talk with Jodie. Jodie has an organisation called Gateway Women and lives in Ibiza. That's not the main reason that we want to talk, but... um, (laughs) I'm always quite envious. And Jodie's been quite tricky to pin down because you have a very busy household in the summer months, don't you, Jodie? Well, yes, we kind of call it guest again here in the summer. It's a little bit of a disadvantage of living on a beautiful Mediterranean island. Everyone wants to see you in the summer. Cheap holidays, I guess, as well, Jodie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there is that too, yes. Well, fantastic. So- Every now and again, Jodie kind of flies back to London, probably more often than than I, I'm aware of, because you are extremely busy. Last time I saw you was at Fertility Fest, where you were involved talking about this term, childless not by choice, is mm. how we refer to it. And it's becoming much more of a, of a common conversation. But there is still stigma attached, and I know that there's still a lot more that needs to be done talking about it. And we're going to be talking about World Childless Week. But as a starting point, Jodie... Just talk a bit about how long Gateway has been running and a bit about you within Gateway. Well, Gateway Women began with a blog that I wrote in 2011. So it'll be kind of nine years old sort of next year. And I wrote that first blog on a new blog that I'd started called Gateway Women, really thinking, well, if one woman in the world reads this and gets it, that's more understanding than I'm getting anywhere else. And because I had been sort of at that point, I was probably two years into my own sort of realisation that I definitely wasn't going to be a mum. And I was getting no support, no recognition, no validation, no understanding anywhere in my life, personally, professionally, socially. Uh, I didn't know anybody who, like me, had wanted to be a mum and it hadn't worked out. And there were no representations in the culture of women like me. And when I went online... All I could seem to find at that time was some really, really scary, radical child-free sites from the States, which don't represent, you know, most child-free people that I, I've met, but, you know, were really radically anti-parents, anti-children. And I thought, oh my God, is, is that what people are going to think about me? So I, I really felt I was speaking into a void with that first blog. I could not have been more wrong. Comments started coming in really quickly from all over the world, from women saying, how do you know the exact words that are in my head? This is exactly how I feel. I got my first piece of PR the day after that first blog. It has been an extraordinary ride. Wow, that sounds amazing. I, patients, Jodie, that are coming towards the end of their fertility journeys and are then kind of looking at some kind of resolution to the end of their journey... What, in your experience, are kind of like the main obstacles that people have to overcome ahead of kind of getting to that point of acceptance? I think stopping treatment. um, And I just say I I never got to the point of having fertility treatments. My marriage sort of broke down as we were considering that. But I've spoken and supported many women, you know, who are thinking about stopping treatment. And I think possibly the word hope 
is a very difficult one and it's people find it very difficult to accept that someone is, and I'm using air quotes here, giving up hope. That is very triggering for a lot of people. It's like, no, you must keep going. You know, you must try again. And this pressure is also internal, this sense that I haven't tried hard enough. Other women and other couples have done more, have tried more extreme things, have spent more money. And I think getting through what other people think about us making that decision to end our fertility journey without a baby and making peace with it ourselves, that internal piece of work is extremely hard and very misunderstood. We need to educate society and our friends and our family how to respond to this because at the moment it's very hard to get support for making that decision. Yeah, you, you raised a really interesting point there, Judy, about kind of people not wanting to get or, or being told that you'd give up hope. And mm. a friend of mine is is also going through this currently and, and coming to terms with what potentially will look at like a, having a wonderful life in a very different way to how she mm. probably initially envisaged it. And she said to me that on Instagram, she'd come across a post that said something along the lines of, don't you dare give up. And to her, that was actually absolutely at that time the wrong thing for her to have read because, Mm. you know, she has given up, but actually she's given up to pursue other things. So it doesn't feel as though it's a failure. Um, But I think we, we have to be really careful with our messages, don't we? Very much so. And we do live in a culture that that prizes kind of personal agency that says that if you're smart enough, you work hard enough, you throw enough money and effort and data and research and time, you, we can solve every problem. And I think when we come up against something which shows us our vulnerability as human beings and how much luck and chance and fate and timing have to do with these things as well, it makes people very uncomfortable. It reminds us and others of our vulnerability as human beings. And so it, it's interesting how much hostility it can provoke. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to say that I think that hope is, I've said it in my work in some places, is one of the most toxic of fertility drugs. And also, hope is actually a form of denial. When we give up hope, we are actually beginning the grieving process. You can't begin the grieving process, which is the path to the other side, to the next part of your life. You know, it's on the other side of that grief. We can't get there without giving up hope. Giving up hope is the first step. And it's actually a really important one but we have a very warped kind of societal idea of it Mm, absolutely the way that we can improve that narrative Jodie I mean Mm. for some people hearing that about hope being that form of denial it's it's quite a switch in maybe how we've been conditioned to to view hope what would you like to see with how we change the narrative well I think when we talk about giving up hope when we talk about you know giving up treatment, stopping, I think at the moment there is this idea that what, what you're giving it up for is something terrible. You know what you were saying, Kate, about you know your friend who is stopping mm. treatment and planning something else. It's that something else. I think if we had a more balanced idea of what life without children can be like, if there were role models that were well known. If the idea of a life without children were not made out to be so utterly terrifying, you know, uh, literally, I mean, I felt when I was in, you know, it was happening to me, that the rest of my life was just a dark lake of infinite width and depth that I had to kind of cross one day at a time and I had no idea how I was doing it. I mean, there was absolutely nothing positive uh, around me that I could aspire to. It was the end of everything. And so, you know, when we talk about hope, we also need to talk about, well, what do people have, you know, to to compare their dream of motherhood and their dream of family life to out there? I mean, a recent piece of research done by Professor Christina Archetti did this extraordinary analysis of films featuring childless women. She analysed 50 films over about a 40-year period. And she found that the way that the story ends for the childless protagonist is one of three ways. And this is in films from three different cultures, three different languages. Either it's a miracle baby. They get given a baby. um, A a pile of snow turns into a baby. You know, something extraordinary. A proper miracle happens. Or they go mad 
and commit suicide or they're murdered. You know, these are the three Gosh. possible outcomes. And if you think about fairy tales, if you think about all of the stories that we know, the childless woman in our culture, in media representations, is represented as the deviant woman. There's an evil character, and it's a woman, she'll be childless or child free, mm. but she will be a woman without children. So it's coming at us from everywhere that to be a woman without children is basically to be wrong, deviant, even evil. Cruella de Vil, that's a perfect example, yep. isn't it? Yes. Great wardrobe, what obviously she did a career dogs. woman. Obviously a career <laughs> woman. <laughs> Bit of a crazy dog lady. Childless <laughs> and evil. Yeah. 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 And, and this is what we're learning from a very early age. It comes at us from everywhere. So it's hardly surprising by the time we become adults and we start wanting to have a family of our own, the alternative, consciously and unconsciously, seems too awful to contemplate. So we've got a lot of work to do in the culture. Hmm. And I know one of the things that you've been doing, you've been collating a whole load of resources for people to, to highlight what has already been said and what is being said for people to go and read and to watch. Tell us the kind of things. I mean, you, you tweeted it was over eight years of childless research. Tell mm. us some of the things that you've, you've kind of found and that you've been curating. Well, interestingly, it's changing. You know, when I first started writing about this in the British press, it was still like completely radical. You know, there was no, our stories weren't out there at all. And I'm, I'm really pleased and proud to say that actually at Fertility Fest this year, you know, so many other people's talks that they were giving or they were referencing the work of Gateway Women and how it had been instrumental in their journey. And now they were out there doing their thing. And it's this sense that it's changed, that it's, it's now becoming more okay to talk about childlessness. It's be certainly becoming more okay to talk about, you know, fertility treatments not working out. We're, we're reading more and more of those stories. The idea of being child-free by choice still gets probably a lot more coverage than the number of child-free women out of a you know, selection of women without children. But the stories of women who are childless by circumstance, so childless for any other reason apart from fertility issues, are still very, very hidden. So the resources that I've been kind of collecting over all those years is whenever a paper comes out, whenever an article is published, an interview, anything like that, I just save the link and I give them all keywords. And I have kind of thousands, you know, thousands of articles and resources and academic papers now, which are all there for anyone who's doing research into this area, you know, to use for their own work. And I'm really pleased to say that, I mean, I'm reviewing some books at the moment. I have to say that that seems to be a big part of my work now is reviewing other people's books and sometimes having the honor of, you know, writing the forwards for them is that there is so much more coming on stream now, so much more both from an academic level, but also kind of first-person stories and everything in between. I think there's a real explosion of stories and literature and research in this area, and there needs to be. There really needs yeah. to be. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Gateway works with women? So when you're talking about you know the resources that are available mm. for women out there, so how, how you work with women and kind of how you help them come to the stage of acceptance. Well, it, it, it varies for, you know, each woman. I mean, some women sort of, you know, they, they find my website or they find the Facebook page and they stalk it for a few years mm -hmm. because it, it, it's yeah. too confronting. They, mm -hmm. they don't really want to go there yet. Either they're perhaps already permanently childless or it's, you know, something it's looking that that's going to be their way. But actually, it, you know, to kind of engage with any of my work feels too much. I mean, I have women who buy my book and it sits on their nightstand for two years before they have the courage to open it because they believe that by opening my book, they are really admitting to themselves that they really are childless. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a huge thing to get involved with the work. So each woman engages with it to sort of a different depth. So some people might just, as you know, read my Facebook posts and stuff like that or buy my book. Then you'll have others who will get involved in a, a reading group for the book. Um, I've got a um, Gateway Women has 6,000 meetup members around the world and 100 individual meetups across many, many different wow. countries in the UK, Ireland, USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and now Israel, which Israel One just started 
this month. I'm really excited about that. That is a tough country to be childless in. It really is. Very, very pronatalist country. So they have like, isn't it? Uh, you're eligible for like two or three rounds, everybody, of, of fertility treatment. It's, it's quite an amazing I think it's at least that. It might be focus. unlimited even. It might even be unlimited oh gosh, yeah. treatement. Yeah, um, goodness I me. have heard. Um, but I, that, I might be confusing that with one of the Scandinavian countries. But yes, there is a great deal of support for fertility mm. treatments. And, you know, women are having large families and most women are having children. So it might be that women go to one of the local meetups or they start a local meetup. Even like the meetups, we have to keep the groups private. We have to keep the addresses and, and dates kind of hidden. And women will sometimes go to a gateway women meetup several times and just walk up and down outside and not have the courage to come in. And this is just coffee in a cafe with a group of women. This is the shame of childlessness. This is the, the fear of the other childless women, that they're going to be weirdos. You know, they're going to be social misfits, awkward weirdos. We're just going to be crying all the time. We're going to be embarrassed to meet them. There's so much negative projection that goes on to childless women that the childless women then have about each other, which kind of, you know, makes them fearful of being seen with each other or getting to know them. Then they get to know them and they discover it's complete rubbish. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. so, you know, you've got to get through that. They might join one of uh, the Gateway Women private online community, which has got, you know, members from all over the world. That's probably the way that most women interact with me because I no longer do private sessions with clients. I'm a psychotherapist, but I, I don't have time to do private sessions with clients with everything that's happening at Gateway Women. I created this workshop called the Reignite Weekend, which is like a healing workshop for childless women, which I ran over 40 times. And now I've trained other facilitators to, to run them. So they, they're now running. So more than 1,500 women have been through that process in the last seven years as well, which is amazing. And I think the only regret anyone's ever had about attending one, which is beautiful, was they wish they'd done it sooner. So, you know, that's a, a workshop which is really all about helping women get to acceptance and also giving them new childless friends to refresh their social circle. Because mm. one, of the, the, one of the collateral losses of involuntary childlessness is that it often decimates your friendship group. I personally didn't have a single friend who didn't become a mum apart from two who didn't want to, <laughs> you know, two who were child free. You know, I was literally the only one and nobody in my family or amongst my colleagues or anyone was in the same situation as me. So, you know, for me, childlessness also brought isolation and loneliness and it happens to an awful lot of us. So Gateway Women, that's why I call it a friendship and support network. And the friendship part of it is so important. Mm. It's quite amazing the language that you use around this. When I know that you've been in this place, in a good place mm. for some time, we've had explosion and collateral losses when you're describing about this like transition that people have had to go through yeah. to the, kind of come out the other side. And, and, and I know from some of the people that you've worked with, Yvonne John, who I know is mm. part of the um, Reignite um, weekend, I've, I've heard stories of people coming out the other side and yeah. when we talked earlier about the perception of childless women do you think as people hear more of those stories and they realize that a this isn't a choice and the impact it has on people and they can see how people can come out of it it's like coming back into the light people's perceptions will start to change hopefully I do think people's perceptions will change I think it will take a generation so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that my work is almost a decade of that. So I'm hoping that in another decade, we'll see some real shifts. I take great heart and inspiration from the way that the, you know, that our kind of gay brothers and sisters have really changed the way society perceives, you know, sexuality. And our no HR department now would neglect to consider um, that as part of their diversity agenda. Although I have to say, women without children in the workplace, and to some extent men too, but you know, my focus is, of my work is with women. I say that women without children in the workplace, and this is a quote from my TED talk, uh, is the biggest diversity group HR hasn't heard of. We are 20 to 25% of the mature female population. 
the LGBTQIA plus population is 10%. You know, we are a massive subgroup in society. Everybody knows someone affected by this issue. Yet we are completely missing from corporate agendas, HR agendas, government policy, everywhere you can imagine we should be, we're not. And interestingly, Jodie, in my experience, when I used to, a long time ago, when I was kind of working in in the kind of acute medical units and working alongside women who didn't have children, is women without children are put upon a lot, aren't they? They're the ones that, oh, yes, you, you can work Christmas Day because you haven't got children, so you don't need to be at home. I found that really interesting, that why should they be any different, yet they were treated very differently. Well, if you, if you backtrack to what we said earlier about those messages that have come through the culture about the value of a childless woman's life, you know, that she's a kind of evil, deviant misfit, if you imagine that that's kind of been fed to you from a very young age, then unconsciously you are going to see women without children as having less value. Mm. And this all comes back to an ideology which is called pronatalism. So rather like, you know, you know, ageism, sexism, all of those things. It's pronatalism. It's the belief that someone who has children is intrinsically of more value than someone who doesn't. Mm. Even though they were both born childless and they were both childless till a certain point, once that person becomes a parent, they have more value than someone who isn't a parent. And this is extremely problematic because childless People, whether by choice or not, are civic members of society. They pay their taxes towards a society that um, the people who have children, you know, rely upon, and we do that willingly. Yet there's this idea that somehow we're not worth anything, or we're worth less, and it's a it's a huge issue, and probably the biggest issue that we get kind of complaints about, and that women are upset about, is is issues of being treated as less than at work, and also within families. Because, you know, there are things where, you know, between child siblings, when one has children and one doesn't, there's so much subtle and over discrimination and a difference in the way they can be treated that causes incredible unhappiness and upset and causes yeah. family estrangements. But once again, so much of it is unconscious that it can be incredibly hard to call people on their behavior because deep down they believe it's right I mean, back to what Natalie said about educating, we, we have so much work to do to educate society about how pronatalism privileges the experience of one set of people over another in a way that in the 1970s, for example, it was completely acceptable for a comedian on British television to kind of, you know, pretend to be a gay person for laughs. And that was all he was doing was pretending to be gay. And it was funny. And everyone was allowed to laugh at it. That would now be hate speech. You know, it would now be completely yeah. unacceptable. You know, that's just in 40 years. We now see that that is completely unacceptable. So yeah. we've got a lot of work still to do around childlessness. Oh, absolutely. And I, I remember, Jodie, at one of the fertility fests a couple of years ago, meeting Tessa Broad, and she had written a letter to her unborn child, and she was reading it out, and she was talking, uh, I think Tessa's in her 60s, and she was saying about how she, for many years, never even spoke to anybody Mm. about it and had never met another childless woman mm. and so that isolation that the community has been doing to itself obviously we've got all the stuff that everybody else is saying and, and yeah. the kind of incorrect narrative but then there's that inward nature of what it brings on but and, that and narrative is internalized the... as well you know on some level until you do the work and this is a lot of the work that we do in my workshops and my courses in my book is rooting out those beliefs that you actually don't even know are there and actually having a look at them and going, is that true? Do I really believe that about other childless women? Do I believe that about myself? How helpful is it to me to believe this? But until you start to kind of really look at it, you know, the shame that comes with believing that you are a defective woman, a failed woman, a barren woman, that you have no value to society. I mean, I used to think, and I, I can hardly believe it now, I used to think I was using oxygen that really would be more useful to someone else. You know, I really oh. thought I had no value at all as a human being. You know, that is grief talking. You know, that is the depths of grief. I did not see any point to my continued existence if I, you know, because I didn't have children. Wow. So 
Let's talk about men for a moment. I know that mm. you said that your focus is on women. Yeah. And I completely get that. But we've been doing, um, just recently, over the last few weeks, a number of episodes where we focused on male fertility. Yeah. And men that are really at the ends of their their fertility journeys. And it's been really popular. So we definitely know there's the, the kind of... Oh, yes. Yeah. The need for men to be talking more, the need for us mm-hmm. all to be talking more about men so how would you say this is different for men would you say it's any easier or would you say it's the same impact or different what would you say well, I, think re- I think research shows I mean Dr Robin Hadley's research yeah. um, would show that actually the impact the emotional impact is as strong as it is on women Absolutely. and perhaps the fact that the social message out there is that it has less impact on men is one of the things we need to change because that means that people aren't looking to hear men's stories because they think they're fine with it. Um, Mm. I mean, one of the things I I know through my work with women and couples is that quite often as the, um, and this is in heterosexual couples, as the woman starts to get some relief from her grief and starts to move forward, I wouldn't say in a linear way towards acceptance because it's by far from a linear journey, but, you know, she's getting some relief, she's getting some support. He can see that, you know, that she's starting to be herself a little bit more again. That's often when he starts grieving. It's often when he's been holding it back, consciously or unconsciously, in order to, quote unquote, be strong for her. And once he knows that someone else is helping her, he can let go of it. And that can be a real shock in couples because actually it can cause quite a lot of anger because the woman can be, well, where was this five years ago when I was on the floor? You know, and you seem to be fine. And now I'm starting to feel better and, you know, and and you're, you're in pieces. I mean, it can be really, really hard grieving as a couple. So I interviewed some men for the last edition of my book. And I remember this one guy and I, I said to him, so how did you, what did you do to help me, you know, to help you with your grief? And uh, he said, uh, I did a lot of mountain biking. Mm. And there was just no part of me that could understand how that would help. You know, and I, uh, I said, oh, w- with a group of men? And he went, yeah, yeah. I went, childless men? He went, no. I said, so did you kind of talk about your childlessness? No. We just went mountain biking. And I guess that's very kind of, I guess, stereotypical of, of men, isn't it? That men actually prefer to grieve on their own perhaps that's how, where they get their support from is that they just go and do it alone do you, well, do you been, know it... they've been taught they've been taught they've been conditioned yeah absolutely uh, to be not, that way. To, not to be vulnerable and to show vulnerability is to show weakness I mean sort of every year on Father's Day I've kind of reached out and I've said if there's any man out there who would like to set up a sort of what I've done for gateway women for men I'm here I'll mentor you I'll share everything I've learned you know, I'm here. I've had two men sort of come forward, one of whom is potentially still possibly going to do something, but I don't know quite what or when, so I won't say anything. But because of the cultural issues around talking about vulnerability and feelings, because of the way that fertility is connected to virility, as wow. Benjamin Zephaniah so brilliantly said at, at Fertility First, it places men in such a difficult position with regard to getting support around this. I mean, I remember once I, I was leading a reignite weekend. Uh, I think this was about 2013, 14. And uh, unusually, everyone in the room was partnered. Quite often, it's a mixture of women in relationships, women not in relationships, different sexualities. This weekend, everyone was in a couple. Everyone was in a heterosexual couple. And they kept saying to me, it'd be really good if you could do something for men. And... By the way, it's usually women asking me to do something for men. I hardly ever hear from men asking me to do anything. It's nearly, I'd say, 99 times out of 100, it's women. So I said, okay, I'd like you to go home to your partners and I can suggest, you know, we could do a couples workshop. I could do a workshop where I bring in a male co-facilitator and we'll do that. You know, let me know what they think, whatever, you know, I'll, I'll make it happen. What do they want? And this was 12 couples. And the most positive answer that came back was, if you really want me to, darling. That was it. The idea of sitting in a room, either with or without their partners, talking about their childlessness with a bunch of either other couples or other men, was hideous for them. 
this is why I really think it needs to be led by a man, um, mm. you know, someone who's experienced all that conditioning themselves. It's probably going to be something very different from how, you know, Gateway Women operates. Maybe it will involve a lot of mountain biking, mm. but the need is there. And if anyone is listening to this and they're thinking, actually, I'm that man, contact me. I'll well, maybe help. we need to put you in touch with our lovely Rod. Um, who I know Rod. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Rod Silvers. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 we shared Rod's story and you'll know, Jody. he's becoming yeah. more of a voice and, and yeah. finding that the reactions he's getting as a result of becoming mm-hmm. more of a voice is actually quite... I suppose reassuring is one mm. way to go about it because we know that it's not a given that putting men in a place where they can talk that they will talk and it's not a given that they want to talk even if these things are set up. It's just, I suppose, showcasing that we're enabling it and you know, that just the feedback that we've had on the episodes that we've shared recently and it's something I've been doing for a good while now, putting a voice there for men. There's, there's always comments, people saying thanks, I don't talk about it with anybody. And also, mm. I still don't know if I want to talk about it, but it's good to hear the other well, stories. Maybe in a way, the conversation in private, listening to a podcast is something, you know, that respects their desire for that privacy, but also gives yeah. them a chance to feel those vulnerable feelings. It could be that that is one of the ways it's going to happen. Let's focus a bit on World Childless Week because the growth of it as an event in the last couple of years is really significant. The fact that it's getting a whole week's worth of attention, the fact that it encompasses men and women, and mm-hmm. sadly the fact that it's a worldwide thing, which we know in facility is such an issue. Do you want to talk a bit about your involvement? Absolutely. So uh, it was started three years ago, um, so 2017, by Stephanie Phillips. And she kind of thought she'd do something on Facebook and expected you know, just a little bit of interest. And it went viral very quickly. I was sort of involved in helping support that just around sort of doing social media, doing a post every single day, you know, writing a blog every single day about the different themes And then the second year that it happened, which was last year, she invited me to what she calls a World Childless Week champion. Yvonne John, as you were talking about earlier, is one as well. So I've kind of been involved behind the scenes all year, helping to think about the event, you know, doing all I can to amplify it. I mean, I'm absolutely thrilled by it because, you know, over the years, of course, you know, I've had an idea of doing something similar, kind of a childless day. And... I just had my plate too full, can't do everything. So when Steph started this, I was just like, brilliant, I'm on, I'm in. Brilliant. <laughs> and, uh, it's a huge pleasure because it's, it's bringing together childless voices from all over the world in terms of the different champions who are involved and uh, creating a diversity of conversations. And I think, you know, so many of us who are involved in providing resources and support to this community are like gateway women, you know, sort of one woman or one men bands, working on our own, doing most of what we do online. And so it's really lovely to bring us all together, all of the people who are doing the supporting, because that then amplifies everyone's message and gives a chance for more childless people to kind of find all of those different individual resources that are available. Because, you know, the style of gateway women is going to it's going to vibe with, with one woman, but it may be not quite their thing. Maybe I'm not quite their personality. I think really important to think about diversity, which is, you know, why Yvonne's work is so important, is to try and broaden this, you know, this, this erroneous idea that childlessness is a white heterosexual middle class issue. You know, it's really important yeah. that we start to see more and more of the diversity of childlessness, different countries, different cultures, ethnicities, genders, sexuality. It... it you know, childlessness is everywhere and everyone. Yeah. And hearing the stories from the different ethnic groups mm. of how that plays out within your community, especially where there's such emphasis in certain communities on families and yeah. barren women, it's a lifeline. And like you said, when you did that very first blog nine years ago, mm. if one woman read it, and yeah. the same, like you've just said, if all these different points, I think it's amazing. We'll put the details of when... World Childless Week is this I'm going episode to be, is going I'm out. going to be recording um, I'm going to be recording a call which is going to go out on the We Are Worthy Day of Childlessness which is Saturday the 21st which is actually about diversity and childlessness 
and I'm inviting a really, really diverse selection of childless people onto the kind of the Zoom video call to really show the different voices and faces of childlessness. And also Gateway Women is hosting We Are Worthy meetups all over the world on Saturday the 21st. And also on the 14th and 15th of September, there is a Gateway Women Reignite weekend dedicated to World Childless Week being led by Yvonne John and Melanie Dagg. And we're offering some scholarship places on that. We're offering three free places in honour of the third year of World Childless Week and a reduced fee for everyone else. And we're donating most of the profits to World Childless Week. Oh, wow. So do do check it out. (laughs) Mm. So in my hands right now, I have your beautiful book. Thank you. Um, Living the Life Unexpected, 12 Weeks to Your Plan B for a Meaningful and Fulfilling Future Without Children. I love I love the beauty of it, especially because it's teal and gold, which are my branding colours as well. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I love it. It sits very nicely on my desktop. So tell us how your book's doing. We would want to hear what's happening with the book right now. Well, my goodness. Um, I mean, the first edition of my book, it was called Rocking the Life Unexpected. It was self-published and crowdfunded from Gateway Women all around the world. So it was really like a community effort. The logo was designed by a Gateway Women member. And that was on sale sort of, you know, as a self-published book for a couple of years before it got picked up by a publisher, which is Bluebird, which is Pan Macmillan. Once again, lovely piece of serendipity was actually someone who works at Pan Macmillan is a Gateway Woman and she suggested it to, you know, to Bluebird. Um, So the the first time it came out with a sort of traditional publisher was 2016. It's been translated into Czech, bizarrely, but, um, you know, I really would love it to be translated into Spanish and German and other languages, but those countries are still not recognising the size of their own markets for this area. You know, we're a very hidden population. So, and you um, shared an interesting piece about Spain, I saw. Absolutely, About yeah. childless women in Spain the other day. It has one of the highest rates of women without children in Europe. Actually, some of the most traditional countries do, um, Italy as well. Mm. I mean, in Germany, it's one in three, you know, women without children, so high. What's so the, the idea the UK? that do you know? Um, they're, they're changing. Um, for my age group, which is I'm 55, it's one in four. The younger ones, it's one in five. So those born in the 70s. But we're still waiting to see the statistics because in Britain, it's the Office for National Statistics uses the the first day of your 46th year as the marker as whether you've had children or not. So obviously that means we have to wait a long time for everyone who was born in the 70s to get to 46 before we get the data. So at the moment, all we've got is 1971 so far, and that's 18%. But my sense from what I've known, from early predictions and from the combination of the millennial generation, the 2008 global turndown and, you know, climate change issues and housing instability and economic factors, I think it's going to be a lot higher yeah, for those early 70s increase. and 80s, both voluntary and involuntary. Mm-hmm. I, I really think that we could be heading for one in three as well like Germany 20, which is shocking in 20 years time <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's really quite shocking and you know I was born in the 70s and I'm mm. I'm thinking of my friends and when you say that one in five that's that's a huge number it's a massive mm-hmm. number it's more than I thought it would be it's always a much bigger figure than people realize because we're hidden in plain sight mm. it's, um, and it's 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 a difficult one because you don't know if someone's chosen or if they're struggling with it you know, unless someone offers that information, you don't know. Yeah. And then, of course, with fertility treatments, perhaps they're trying well into their mid-40s. You just yeah. don't know. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. So my publishers are bringing out a new edition, which is very exciting. So next spring, so spring 2020. So I'll have a, a new cover and um, some changes inside, updating all of the data and everything, which is like, I just want to bang my head on the desk thinking of that because I've got to do that before the middle of October, Um, (laughs) um, which is when I'd much rather be working on my novel, which I've just finished the first draft of. Oh, wow. Um, Fictional novels. Yes, uh, which features a kick-ass childless heroine, the like of which the world has not yet met. (laughs) Amazing. We look forward um, to that. Yes, definitely look forward to that. A single childless menopausal heroine. Hang on, world, you have not dealt with this before. (laughs) (laughs) 
sounds interesting. Oh, it, does, yeah. it does sound great. I mean, before we let you go, Jodie, we've got yeah. such a shift in what's happened online with, um, as we'll refer to it as the TTC community, or just the just the presence yeah. of more conversations online. Do you feel a slight sense of optimism about how we move forward with these conversations with the growth and the openness of this online community and the support available now I mean you're really prominent on the different platforms that Mm. you're on sharing information and getting reactions I mean it's transformed so many communities does it make you feel slightly more optimistic I mean I'm incredibly optimistic by nature so um, you know I am optimistic and when I look at the change between now and a decade ago when I was looking I mean, if you type even the word childless into Google now, how many resources there are out there? I've spent the morning updating my books list on my website. I can't keep up now with the number of books that are coming out. I actually can't even read all the books that are coming out that are being sent to me for review. It's fantastic. It has transformed. And to go back to what I was talking about, the way the gay liberation movement has transformed the experience of the LGBTQIA community, Uh, in a generation, I'm completely up for us doing the same for those living as non-parents in a family-centric world. Well, it's been so lovely again, hearing your insight on it and hearing what Gateway has enabled and and continues to, I suppose, facilitate around the globe. And we're going to share this episode just ahead of World Childless Week. So we'll make sure people have got all the details of those different check-in points that you mentioned, Mm -hmm. as well as the website and everything. And good luck with it. And good luck with the fictional book. We look forward to hearing about your heroine. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's been it's been a real it's been a real pleasure to talk to you again, Natalie, and to meet you, Kate. Thank you very much, Ellie. It's been lovely. So interesting talking to you, and I will definitely be signposting ladies your way without without doubt. Thank you very much. Right, there was so much there, wasn't there? I mean, Jody can talk on so many contentious issues and important issues that we need to understand more, that whole pronatalist idea and childless women being overlooked in the workplace and by HR people. I mean, she said an amazing quote about childless women being the kind of group that HR haven't heard of. She yes. mentioned a TED Talk, which I'll make sure we can put a reference to. I mean, it's heartbreaking. It's enough that fertility, infertility in the workplace is an issue. But if you at that point where, you know, it's not going to be what you thought, you're not going to have a child, that you're totally overlooked in your in your professional life. Yeah, I mean, I find it really interesting. And I think one of the, obviously, when we talked and I mentioned about in my experience of working with groups of women and how the one without children is often often say kind of oh right well you can do that because you don't have to be home in time or whatever and, and it, it's a really horrible way to be but I think I think we're probably all all guilty or have been guilty of it at, at some point but yeah just fascinating listening to her and and all about how she supports women but also I really liked the quote when she said and that really resonated when she said about the book this beautiful book how women buy her book and it sits on their nightstand and they don't open it because opening it is admitting that they're now childless. That's quite powerful, isn't it? Really powerful. And really sad, really sad. And we're both aware that the conversation that we've just had with Jodie and and some of the other conversations that we've had doing this show might trigger you, might provoke feelings that you might not have expected. And so that's why we want to kind of offer ourselves as support by making the content, but also for you getting in touch. So. If there's any Mm. kind of questions or or feelings about what we've been talking about, please do email talkfertility at gmail.com because the whole aim of Kate and my conversation and the guests that we bring into this space is to is to start conversation but also continue it so like I was saying we do invite your kind of questions because if you've heard the podcast before you'll know it was just me and since Kate's come into the mix with her medical background I can get an expert on hand to answer your questions so we have another one here it's more of a fertility related one it's not to do with childlessness it's about AMH isn't it one of those acronyms Hmm. that people are like what I don't know I haven't been tested or have I been tested is it high is it low is it good what's the question that we've been we've been asked so we've had a lady who had an AMH test so an AMH test is it's anti-malurin hormone and it looks at ovarian reserve and she got the result back I think we've just given the result and the clinic said it was good but she wants to know a bit more about it and how good AMH or ovarian reserve testing kind of gives you an indication on your fertility longevity but it's not 
It should never be used in isolation. It's just one marker that can determine fertility reserve. To give you more information, you should really look at it in combination with other factors, so other blood tests and potentially antrophological count scan. But AMH is determined based on age. So for this lady, without absolutely knowing her age, so please do email back in with your age and I can give you more information. But without knowing your age, it's really difficult for me to determine exactly where your AMH should be sitting within the parameters for your age group. But definitely, if you can let me know, I will be able to tell you. So that's one thing that is always important to know is when you get your AMH result, it is based on age and there are different parameters for depending on whether you're 25 or whether you're 45. So would like more of your questions, please. Talkfertility at gmail.com is the email. Also, you can follow us on our socials. On Insta and Twitter, I'm at Fertility Poddy. And on Insta, I'm Your Fertility Journey. And on Twitter, I'm Fert Journey. And we'll be back again next week. Okay, then. The show notes of this episode are the fertilitypodcast.com forward slash world childless week. If you're listening in real time, as I said at the start, it's taking place from the 16th to the 22nd of September. And the website worldchildlessweek.net has all sorts of information for you to contact them, to donate, to be a part of it. So please, if anything that Jodie has said during our chat has resonated with you, reach out. Please don't feel that you are on your own, especially if you're faced with a difficult decision, because that's the whole point of the content that I'm trying to share is to help you feel that there is someone that gets where you're at. Okay, I hope you found this podcast useful. As always, thank you for your support. Sorry for the um, the life stuff going on around it. I've just had to share it with you on what is a pretty busy weekend. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this episode. If you like what you hear, please rate and review, subscribe and share the Fertility Podcast because that helps keep it going. Until the next time. <laughs>